Hello and welcome to episode 382 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert, as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, we're back. We had a week off. Well, truth be told, letting people behind the curtain, I feel like hugging Andy because I haven't seen Andy for a, a few weeks, basically, because I actually had more than one week off from Money to the Masses. So I went away with my family. And so we produced the podcasts and bits and pieces before I went away. So I am highly energized excited to be back doing the podcast because it's been longer than you guys realize since we've been together and doing the podcast so yeah we are back we're back in the same room and raring to go yeah it's really nice to be back i went away for a, for a week or so or two with a family rest and recuperate and uh, if, oh, one thing i'm doing though damien now is stressing about how much money i spent holidays are expensive they're, they're expensive and obviously Cost of living crisis has been something that's arrived pretty much in 2022 and where most of us who booked holidays probably booked them before. And so now we've come back to the realities of the world. And this is really the theme of the podcast this week. But before I go on to tell you what's on the podcast, I just wanted to say to people, if you are going away, do listen to podcast episode 377, where we talk about the best ways to take money abroad, because the tips of using things like Starling and Revolut, which we talk about in that episode, they are great products that obviously I've used while traveling abroad to save a fortune in fees. So I just wanted to nod towards those. So if you are going to be traveling, perhaps in the October half term or whatever, then do listen to that podcast episode because it will save you money. Okay, so you alluded to it there, Damien. It's going to be a bit of a sort of cost of living special. We're going to be talking about a few things that have been dominating the press. So explain what we've got coming up in this week's show. So while I'm sitting on holiday, I... Perhaps should be switching off, but inevitably I don't. And I start looking at the cost of living crisis because even if you're not in the UK, you can't help but notice the headlines and already feel the impact of it. So things have shifted significantly while I've been away. So I want to talk about mortgages and preparing for what's coming. So if you have a mortgage, you want to listen to this part of the podcast is revisiting something we did talk about back in March, but there is a significant shift that's important. We're also going to talk about whether now is the time to be fixing your energy deal, because in the past, the best tariffs have been the energy company's standard tariffs because of the energy cap. Now, while I was away, the increase to the energy cap has been announced that's going to happen in October. And it means that the landscape has shifted. We're now at the point where projections for where energy prices are going now next year are so high that thinking about fixing your energy tariff has now become that bit more attractive for many people. So what we're doing is we're distilling down all the scaremongering to give you the reality of what's coming and the things to look out for to be able to make that decision for yourself. And finally, Harvey's coming on the show for a short piece about carving out benefits, in this case, medical insurance in particular, when you leave an employer, which is likely to be quite relevant in this environment where I think we're going to see a lot of flux and change in people's employment. Okay, well, let's get started then. Mortgages. So if you go back to podcast 367, which was, I think we did it in May 2022, it was called Preparing for Fixed Rate Mortgage Deal Ending. And we also talked about energy cutoff rules. So both of those are relevant to today's podcast. But the world has shifted significantly since we made that podcast. In fact, in the last couple of weeks on both topics, energy and mortgages, they have shifted significantly. And so to draw an analogy with being on holiday, the way I see things at the moment is like you're laying on the beach while on holiday. And while my family would be enjoying that, I'm realising or sensing for earthquakes, worrying about a tsunami that's going to be coming in the future. And of course, in those environments, the best thing to do is head for higher ground, not just sit there and sunbathe and just see what happens and hope a tsunami doesn't actually occur. And so taking that idea, that's what the podcast is about this week, is looking at mortgages in particular, because there has been an earthquake. And it's not about trying to scaremonger people, not trying to depress people. Some of the figures we will talk about will Will be pretty depressing it's about taking back control and when you're feeling a bit of drift and you're worried about things taking steps now will help you feel in control and will hopefully limit the suffering that you might have further down the line so the earthquake that i alluded to there is the shift in market expectations of where the bank of england base rate is going to be so 
Earlier in the year, we were making predictions that with inflation increasing, then the Bank of England would probably have to continue to hike interest rates. Well, as the year's gone on, the Bank of England has kept raising its predictions of where inflation is going. Of course, it's double digit already and it's predicted to get even higher. I've seen one forecast in the last week that suggests we could even see 18% in the UK. But putting that to one side, what it means is that the interest rate hikes we've seen this year have accelerated more quickly than was anticipated back in May, for example, when we did that show 367. Now, that show, I have to say, was a fantastic show. I've been back and listened to it because there was a lot of good advice and guidance we gave in there about what you should be doing now ahead of coming off a fixed rate deal. So I'm not going to go over all of that. So go back and listen to that show first and then take on board what I'm telling you now about where interest rates are likely to go. Now, just a month ago, before I went away, so we're talking about at the beginning of August, the market anticipation of where interest rates would be a year from now had jumped to 3%. So they thought the base rate would be at 3% this time next year. So next summer of 2023. Now the current base rate is 1.75%. We've had a recent interest rate hike. They're predicted to go up again in September, but the shift has increase further and the market is pricing in that the bank of england base rate is going to be around 4.25 percent by august next year so basically a year from now august september 2023 you're looking at a base rate of 4.25 percent now that is a massive shift it's one of the biggest shifts i've ever seen in, in the expectations of where interest rates are going to be in such a short period of time just weeks that shift occurred in the market's view now that is a significant impact on fixed rate deals, obviously. So when you look at where fixed rate deals are going to be, if you look at them now compared to where the base rate is, if you're going to get a two-year fixed rate mortgage a year from now, then likely the best rate you're going to get is about 5.5%. Now, the worse your LTV, your loan to value is, so the higher your mortgage is compared to your house price, and don't forget house prices might potentially stagnate or fall, we just don't know, then that means that the fixed rate that you might get this time next year could be 5.5% or higher. Now, I know that this is all based on market predictions and just as quickly as they can ratchet up, they could come back down depending on what happens in the economy and the central bank's response to that. So what this really is about is looking at where the market thinks things are going and trying to make adjustments to ease that pain. Now, what does that really mean in pounds and pens? So If you are going to remortgage, you're on a fixed deal now already, let's say, which a lot of people are, and they may have moved during the pandemic when the stamp duty holiday was around. So there'll be a lot of people who are coming off two year fixed rate deals. Then the reality is that the fixed rate deal you're likely to get next year is probably going to be about 4% higher than the one you've got. And so the reality is that for every £100,000 of mortgage that you have over, say, a 25-year term, you are likely to see your monthly repayments go up by £200. So that's a finger in the air, an, an estimate based on the numbers that I've looked at. So that gives you a guide to how much your mortgage is likely to go up. So obviously prepare. If you go back to that podcast that I talked about, 367, I talk about building a buffer. So if you are able to, a lot of people might not be able to, but if you're fortunate enough, because energy bills haven't gone up yet, the increases we're going to talk about later, mortgage rates haven't rocketed as yet for those people on fixed rate mortgage deals, you might not be feeling that squeeze just yet, but you will do. It's like that tsunami that's coming. So get to high ground prepare if you can by putting money aside potentially to build a buffer which you can then withdraw from to help ease the hike in mortgage rates you're going to have perhaps for the next few years. Now the mortgage market has shifted because deals are being pulled on average after 17 days so that means when you go on these comparison sites you see the best deal in the market it's only lasting about 17 days which is the shortest period on record before it's pulled by the lender because people are jumping on them because they are worried about rising interest rates so when you get to a period when you want to look to remortgage then you are probably going to have to act quickly. So you need to get your stuff in order, as we talked about in Podcast 367. And also, it means that due to volume of people remortgaging, it might take you a bit longer for the actual process to go through. So we've talked about in the previous podcast that, yes, if you go into remortgage, then you can start looking around, get in touch with a broker, 
six months ahead of your deal ending because you can potentially lock into a new deal that will start when your existing deal comes to an end. So you can get the best rate possible at that point. If you're doing a product transfer where you're staying with the same lender, but you're just switching to a new deal. Now, in that instance, typically you could only do that three months ahead of the time that your deal would end. But there has been some good news. There's been a shift in lenders who are allowing people to do it sooner than they had previously. So We'll link to an article on our website where we actually tell you about the changes from certain lenders. But to give an example, NatWest, they used to only allow you to do a product transfer to a range one four months before your current deal comes to an end. They now allow you to do it six months before. So work out where your fixed deal comes to an end and then diarize accordingly so you can take advantage. So that is some good news that people are probably going to be able to take action sooner if they're just doing product transfers. I feel there'll probably be quite a few people doing product transfers because when you do that, the administration and what you need to be able to have that product transfer is a little bit less onerous than having a complete remortgage, particularly to another lender. So this piece of the podcast, I'm telling you what next year could look like for a lot of people. And so therefore you need to start thinking about that and taking action. It's just almost ringing the alarm bells a little bit louder. And so if you take action, you'll feel a bit better. It raises the question now, is it worth paying the early repayment charge on a fixed mortgage that you've currently got to get out of it? Because if rates are predicted to ratchet up so quickly in the next year, then maybe you'll be better off fixing now. Now, there is actually a case where that's starting to become more attractive. You have to crunch the numbers because an early repayment charge is where you end a fixed rate deal, remortgage now, and you normally have to pay a percentage of the outstanding loan. Depending on the type of mortgage, it could be tiered. So let's say you might have a five-year fixed mortgage that's coming to an end. Over the five years of the fixed period, you might have to pay 5%, 4%, 3%, 2% decreasing each year by 1% until the last year you only pay 1% of the outstanding loan to actually remortgage elsewhere as an early repayment charge. Some of them will be fixed for the whole period. You might have a two-year fixed, say, and it's a 3% charge for the whole time of that fixed period. So you want to look at those numbers. If you speak to a mortgage broker, they can help you. But I have found a really good calculator online, which is called Nous. Dot co. So N-O-U-S dot co. We'll put a link in the show notes. And what it does is you put in your current early repayment charge. You tell it what the best rate you can currently get by looking on a comparison site if you remortgage now. And you tell it the date when your deal is due to end. Let's say it's a year from now. And it uses projections in the background of where interest rates are likely to go. A bit like I've been doing earlier on in this podcast. And you can set it to be very pessimistic or very optimistic or somewhere in between. And it will crunch the numbers and tell you whether it's worth you paying your early repayment charge and getting out of your current mortgage and locking into a deal now. So it's unusual that it ever would be good to pay the early repayment charge. But because of the potential tsunami we're looking at, it's going to start becoming a bit more attractive to some people. So that's the message again on this part of the podcast. We'll link to that calculator so you guys can have a play around. And often it will not be worth actually paying that early repayment charge, but you can seek advice if you're not sure. And I would always suggest you do if you're thinking of paying an early repayment charge. And the other thing I would say is that the question I'm always asked is how long should you fix for? Now that is the million dollar question. It's up to you. At the moment, people are still picking two year fixes more than five year fixes. There's a popularity in it. And that's because there's a chart that I've shared on Instagram and other social platforms. And we'll link to that in the show notes to where I chart the latest projections of where the market thinks the base rate is going. Although it will get to 4.2% next year, they then predict that the Bank of England will have to start reducing interest rates because obviously we're going to go into a recession. So it is the consensus among economists. And so if that's the case, people are thinking, well, two years maybe from this year or next year, then interest rates will be low and they'll want to remortgage then to get a better deal. So Some people will like certainty because that's the thing. In an environment like we are now, maybe what we're facing with the cost of living crisis, it's no longer always about necessarily being the cheapest. It's about certainty as well. So some people might look at their budgets and think, look, I'm going to have a real squeeze here. This is the absolute maximum I can cope with. And if I can lock in at that rate, so it might be you go for a five year fixed and you end up paying a higher mortgage for longer If rates come down in the future, they might not. They might rock it even higher, which will be quids in. But you might like that certainty. And that is a personal choice. There is no right or wrong. 
only hindsight tells you which would have been the cheapest way of doing things, whether it's to have a shorter term fix or stay on a variable rate or to get a five year fix. You've got to do what you want to do, not what your friends and family do or the people who are at dinner parties or whatever you go to say they're doing. Certainty is important in your own finances. So live like it's late 2023 is really the message that I'm saying. And obviously, if you're a landlord, the one thing I'm going to throw out there that you might not realise that lenders are also increasing the stress tests that they're using for when you come to remortgage. So obviously, there's the element of how much your rent's got to cover the mortgage. But the stress test they're using the interest rates in the background of those calculations are also going up. So you obviously see an increase in the amount that you pay. So again, you need to start doing some research and talking to a mortgage broker well ahead of time. I think that's really nicely summed up. And actually, we have got an article that Damien updates regularly that explains where the market predicts the interest rates are going. And I'll link to that in the show notes as well. So let's move on to energy now. Now, it's a similar theme. It's quite depressing, but we've crunched some numbers, Damien. And I think it's it's right that we bring this to the podcast. Yeah, it is because we don't want people burying their head in the sand. I feel like there's a responsibility to get everybody thinking about trying to insulate themselves from this cost of living crisis because the worst of it is yet to come and if you take control you'll feel better about it if you've got a plan you won't necessarily mitigate the cost of living crisis you won't and a lot of this stuff that we're talking about don't forget it's assuming no government intervention no interventions from the central banks like the bank of england by cutting interest rates because the thing is it's not a great strategy to rely on other people until you really have to so yes we hope things will change and things will ease yes we hope that Ukraine war will end. That will have a material impact on our finances, obviously, because it will bring down the cost of things like energy. But hope is not a great strategy. So what you need to do is all you can to try and make things better for yourself and take control of your finances. So on energy, now it's been confirmed that the price cap is increasing quarterly now. And Ofgem has also confirmed that the price cap for energy from October to December will increase by 80% effectively. So what that means is that from October to December, the standing charge on gas will be 28p. The price per kilowatt hour for gas will be 15p. The standing charge for electricity will be 46p. And the kilowatt per hour charge will be 52p for electricity. Now, just to remind people, the price cap is a cap on those charges that I've mentioned. You will see the numbers banded around in the press saying that the average bill will go from £1,971 per year for a typical household up to £3,549. That equates to £296 per month if you average it over the year. Now, that is based upon an average usage for a house. That doesn't really mean anything because houses are different sizes. They have different amount of people. They have different usage. So people lock onto that and think that's going to be my bill. Yeah. And another frustration is that average is based on the average charge throughout the UK. But actually, energy is priced differently depending on where you live in the UK. So again, those numbers are a little bit and they don't really help. So that's what's frustrating when you see these stories. It's scaremongering. And I don't like the scaremongering. I like reality and I like people not putting their head in the sand. But you need actions that you can take, like we were talking about on the mortgage piece. So what can you do with energy? Now, the reality is that energy prices are predicted to ratchet up significantly. So mortgages are going to really eat into people's finances if they're not on a fixed deal or they're coming off one but energy is too. Now, a company called Cornwall Insight, who have had a really good, strong track record of predicting the increases to the cap in the past, have done an assessment and are predicting where energy prices will go in the future. So they've predicted that in January, the price cap will move up another 52%. And then in April, it will go up 23%. And then there'll be a small drop in the summer of next year. Now that is huge. What does that mean though, in reality? Now we crunched the numbers. And in fact, Andy did a lot of the number crunching in the background. I lost him for almost an entire day to spreadsheets and research. But the insights are important. So just to give you a steer, if you were paying for energy real time, which we don't, that would mean the predicted increases mean that, say for September now, you'd be paying £165 in total for gas and electricity in the month based on average usage. So usage in the summer months are lower than the winter months. But we allowed for that increase because as these 
price cap increases are occurring. They're actually occurring in the winter months as well. So our usage goes up, so we'll be paying more for that energy. Now, from October, and you were paying in real time, your monthly direct debit would be £388 combined for gas and electricity. And that was what it would be until January, where it would then hit £581, which it will stay like that until April. And then in real time, you'd be paying £558 per month. And then, of course, your usage starts to drop. And then they predict in June that the price cap will fall moderately. Now, what does that mean if you were to pay a constant direct debit for the next year to take into account all of these increases you keep hearing about? And these are projections, assuming that the government doesn't make any interventions in any way. So this is we're all left to our own devices to suffer the consequences of spiraling energy costs. It means that today you would need to set your direct debit to £480 a month for an average use to allow for the increase in energy costs, but also the increase you're going to use during the winter and then the lower amounts you're going to use during the summer months. So these are estimations using some assumptions, but what this is going to do effectively, if you're worried about things, this is going to keep your head above water. This means that you essentially shouldn't go into debt to the energy Yeah, company. this is dream world. This is that we all had money that was spare and we wanted to protect our finances and we went, right, whatever we're paying now, let's say you're paying £200 a month, then you need to be putting aside an extra £280 a month or if your direct debit hasn't already been increased by an energy company to £480 to ensure that you'll be able to afford energy even if the government doesn't intervene and energy prices keep rising. So they are big ifs. So that is a huge number and the likelihood is the government is going to have to do something about this. So most people won't have that kind of money to put aside, but if you can put something aside, then that would be positive. But it also explains why a lot of people are starting to get energy companies ratcheting up their monthly direct debits to numbers like we've just seen there. So in our office alone, Justin just had his energy company ratchet up his direct debit more than doubling it to over £400 already. And that's because there are factoring in some of these likely increases going forward. Now, what this means is that, of course, energy prices going up and they could go up even faster, we just don't know, that fixing your energy price has suddenly started to look a bit more attractive. And that attraction comes from the idea of certainty. So yes, we're talking about energy prices that a direct debit would be £480 a month if these hikes go ahead with no interventions from the government. But if things get worse, there's nothing to say energy prices can't go much higher. We hope they'd go lower, but there's nothing to say they won't go much higher. Again, if you look at your finances and stress test them, which we all should do, the worst case scenario when we scale back all the things we can do, maybe you get rid of the car, whatever, you cut back your discretionary spend, you cut back your bills, all these things, the absolute stress test, the limit of what you could afford to be paying on things like your mortgage and energy if there's a point you can't go beyond and you're worried about that, then fixing your energy bill might be attractive because then you at least should keep your head above water, even though it will be expensive. So we did some research about the fixed rate tariffs that are out there. And the interesting thing is there are many companies that are starting to issue fixed rate tariffs, but to their own customers, to existing customers only. The problem is they don't appear on a lot of the comparison sites because they don't have to publicize them. They're just for their existing customers. So what you need to do is look around yourself and see what your own energy company is doing in particular. Now, Andy actually crunched the numbers on this and looked at a number of potential tariffs, and they've all been pulled pretty much as this latest cap increase has been announced. And that will continue to happen in the future. But interestingly, if you go and look at the tariffs that are out there now, it's almost bang on the same as the cost that we analysed over the year, allowing for those increases. So put it this way, I explained earlier on what the current pricing is for the energy cap. If we go forward and we have the hikes that the Cornwall Insight predicted, then your benchmark that you need to think about when you go and try and find a fixed deal and say, is it worth me fixing now to stop things being any worse than they're predicted to be, then you need to not pay more than 21p on average for each kilowatt hour of gas. You don't want to pay any more than, say, 29p standing charge for gas. You don't want to pay any more than 74p per kilowatt hour for electricity. 
and 47p for the standing charge on electricity. How we got to those numbers is basically we averaged out where the price cap is predicted to be over the next year. So if you fix now, of course, you're going to be fixing at a higher rate than is currently available. So you will be paying more now, but your charges per kilowatt hour and your standing charges won't increase. So what you're paying now has to be better than the average of the predicted increases. So that's the number. Write those numbers down in the coming months when you're looking at fixed deals and you want to see whether it's worth you doing it because you like certainty then they are the numbers that you want to look at i've seen other people out there talk about if it's whatever percentage of price caps it doesn't really mean anything the price cap is applied to kilowatts hours and the standing charge directly that's what you want to focus on it's a bit like when we look at petrol prices we know how much a pence per liter is and we look at that we don't sit there and look at the average usage of an average car in the uk and how much people spend a month on petrol to try and judge whether a deal is a good deal. Focus on those kilowatt hours. And when Andy crunched the numbers, the cheapest deal at the moment would give you a direct debit based on average usage of £461 a month. And that's a one-year fixed deal that's actually with co-op. But again, these things are being pulled all the time. And so what it means, the deals you're, you're going to get out there now that are likely going to be no better than if you just ride the increases in the price cap, but what they do do is ensure it won't get any worse. And if you like certainty, then that is a good reason for you to consider fixing. And another thing to consider on that, and it's something that we took into consideration when we were doing the research, is exit fees. So you don't want to really fix on a deal if you've still got that question, is it good, is it not? Have a look at the exit fee and work it out. And on this particular deal that we looked at, there was very few available, like Damien said, there was no exit fee on there. So in effect, if you want that certainty, there is no risk, go for it because there's no exit fee. Yeah. So in short, there are no fixed deals cheaper than the current price caps, but there are fixed deals that are cheaper than the future increases that are coming along to the price cap. That's the key point. So if you're worried about the increase going beyond what people are saying, then that's when you look at it. And the other thing I'd say on the exit fees, quite a few do still have exit fees, but the trend in the market is for exit fees to be much higher. In the past, you'd be paying maybe £50 to get out of a dual fuel fixed rate tariff. Now, the exit fees are closer to £200 on some of them. But if you're paying £500 a month nearly on energy at some point, then maybe you think that is something that's worth paying in the background. And it means that people are going to focus on exit fees on energy more now if they do decide to lock in because they want that flexibility. So there is a nice parallel almost with the exit penalties on these energy tariffs. People will be focusing on them more because they still want some certainty, but a bit of flexibility if they want to cancel them and get out of them in the future if energy prices tumble. But there's a parallel with the mortgage market because I think people will be looking at early repayment charges now when they look to fix again because they'll realise that the early repayment charges have meant that remortgaging now won't be cost effective had that early repayment charge been lower then maybe it could have been a bit more attractive to fix earlier so i think people will be focusing a bit more on early repayment charges on mortgages and exit fees on energy because while they might like the certainty they also want a little bit of flexibility if the world changes in the future so before we bring harvey onto the show I know some of those numbers were depressing, but they are worst case scenario. And so if you prepare for the worst and in a way hope for the best, then you won't be disappointed, will you? So with energy, obviously, if energy prices do go to levels, which there is no certainty they will and the government intervention can happen. If they do go to the levels that we were talking about, then there are things you can do like reducing your energy usage and things like that. So we'll base them on assumptions of average usage but i think it'd be irresponsible of us who run one of the most popular money podcasts in the uk not to tell you what i'm doing with my finances which is all of the things i've just talked about today i'm sitting there prepping for the future and i'm basically living the life of 2023 and 2024 now and that is yep depressing but that is a reality Okay, so let's move on to the next piece. Then we're going to be talking to Harvey about carving out insurance products, which is something you can potentially do if you've got a benefit with an existing employer and you're moving on and you're worried about losing that benefit. And so Harvey's here to explain more. Harvey, welcome back to the show. 
Thanks for having me, Andy. Um, so yes, today what we're going to do is talk about um, taking some of your benefits from your employer with you if you end up changing jobs, leaving your employer for any other reason. Where we have employer benefits, they might include things like private medical insurance, health insurance, income protection, life insurance, critical illness cover. These are the types of benefits that your employer may have extended to you through what is known as a group scheme. A group scheme is basically a personal insurance product that doesn't just cover an individual, covers a group of people and normally your employer will pay for this, but it is possible to take some of the benefits within your group scheme with you if you do change employers and you're keen to keep those benefits. Great, so you've covered quite a few products there. We're going to focus on one particular type of insurance for the purposes of the podcast, just to kind of go over the process of of moving that and taking that with you as you go. So we're going to look at private medical insurance, aren't we, specifically in this piece of the pod. So yeah, just explain them. How do you start going about this? The employer benefit that most people are keen to carry on once they leave a job is private medical insurance. Private medical insurance is valuable to many people, sometimes because they've claimed on it and sometimes also because they've got members of their family covered within the policy too. Most employer schemes allow you to add your children, your spouse, your partner to the policy, and it may be something that you wish to continue. Now, just because you've left the employment and the group scheme doesn't mean that you can't continue the cover. Most insurance providers will allow that individual to apply to continue the cover. Continuation is a way of maintaining the cover with all of the benefits that you had previously. You may not get some of the terms and conditions that are unique to the employer scheme. But largely what's of use to people is that you won't have to be underwritten again. You may have to complete some basic medical questions, but if you were covered for certain conditions whilst you were a member of the employer scheme, largely you'll continue to be covered for those conditions on an individual basis once you take a continuation option. Great. So this is of particular interest, I imagine, to people who are moving from one job to another and the new job doesn't necessarily offer that. Obviously, if they do offer that benefit, then you've got a decision to make. You need to weigh up the covers and see how they underwrite the new plan to see if it does cover you. But that would be something that you would need to do yourself and weigh up which is best. That's absolutely right, Andy. So the best thing to do usually is to go to a broker, somebody who's independent, who'll be able to help you continue your cover from your employer onwards, but it also can scan the market to see what other products are available. Because if you're somebody who hasn't suffered medical problems previously, haven't had to use the policy, you may be able to get similar cover for less cost with another provider. And what the broker will do is it will scan the market, present the options to you of continuing your cover, as well as other options that may be more cost effective and comprehensive. Once you have all your options in front of you, you can then make a decision to take the cover that you find most attractive and most affordable for for your needs. What I particularly like about this is this is an option for people who are maybe stalling on a contract offer. They may be weighing things up and they've, they've looked at the salary on the new job, perhaps the location. They're weighing everything up, putting it in the round and thinking, well, actually, the the one thing that I'm really disappointed about is the benefits package that I get with my existing employer. I would hate to lose that. But it is nice to know that there are options. And you could even take what's been offered to you through the broker to your new employer and ask if they will supplement the cost for it. They may not have a group scheme, but as part of your remuneration package, they may agree to pay for your private medical insurance, which you had previously. Okay, so I mean, we've pretty much covered it there. It's a fairly short piece. It's more of a an FYI for people to keep this in mind if they're thinking of switching occupations. And just lastly, Harvey, is there any restrictions in terms of the time frame? Do you need to get in touch with them, say, within a certain period? Generally, soonest is best. Most employer schemes will allow you up to 30 days to continue the cover as an individual, but you can be offered more time than this by some providers. But the best thing to do is start a conversation with a broker, let them know what your group scheme is, ask for the details of this. Your HR department should be able to help you with that. 
the cover that you have with your group scheme may have extra bells and whistles that aren't available in the individual market. So some large corporations will offer benefits such as face-to-face private GP appointments. These aren't largely available if you buy an individual private medical insurance policy. But if you're willing to explore options with the broker, they'll come up with the best package at the best price and where possible will continue to cover you for pre-existing medical conditions too. And so what we'll do is we'll put a link to a short article that Harvey has written on the subject so that it's got all the details, including a link to a broker who will be able to help you if you're in this situation. Thank you so much for coming on, Harvey, to share that. Damien, let's bring you back in. I think we're pretty much done for this week. Aside from the usual, of course, please do review the podcast in all the usual places. Check out the Money to the Masses YouTube channel. There's lots of videos been going out lately. Lauren's been doing a fantastic series about her house move that she did a year ago now, and she's kind of giving all the tips and tricks that she's learned a year on. And of course, don't forget Instagram. I'm back. I'm going to be doing more on Instagram again. And my enthusiasm, I should say our enthusiasm has got the better of us as ever. We always do this stuff about asking for the reviews at the end of the podcast. We must do it at the beginning of the podcast. Please do leave a review, especially if you were an 8020 investor member and I was doing those videos while I was on holiday. Do please leave a review because we've not had a review for the whole time that I've been away, almost since July, the last review I've seen on the on the show. So please do that. It's a real morale booster for the team when you leave us a nice glowing five-star review and who knows you may even get a money to the masses mug and so that's it we're done for this week so do get in touch if you would like to it's damien at money to the masses.com you can contact me it's andy at money to the masses.com so that's it we're done until next time until next time oh.